Becca Atkins Stumbo that I also with OSL has just put, you know, I, I term her the our tech guru. Uh, she had a personal commitment today, so she won't be with us, but her work is uh, greatly appreciated to make uh, all the, the bells and whistles uh, happen. So I've kind of morphed two objectives together for today. And we really would, and this is an overall objective for the entire uh, academy, but we really, our hope is that we can increase the scholar's knowledge and understanding. Those are two key words, knowledge and understanding. And we want to look at supporting students with disabilities and then your leadership component of supporting educators who serve students with disabilities. So if you'll kind of think about that as far as uh, how that's working for you, and uh, we will continue to strive toward the knowledge and understanding, both working with students with disabilities and working with educators who work with students with disabilities. And uh, specific to the agenda today, we're going to have uh, Kathy Anderson, who uh, also is our gifted and talented consultant. So if you may have, uh, you may have, your paths may have crossed in a, a former life and in a different, uh, different work situation. So she's going to be, her, her role today is to introduce and practice some techni technology applications. So we worked with Padlet last, uh, last month and we're going to be, she's going to be working and in introducing our polling everywhere uh, application. So um, a sidebar, if you will, uh, a bird walk that we're going to try to work with every month is to uh, expand and practice uh, technology applications uh, as we work through this. And uh, we have our two featured speakers, which, Chris Thacker, who is a IDEA Kentucky liaison, the data center for IDEA. He is the state representative to that agency. And uh, his session is going to be making sense of federal and state requirements. And then following Chris will be Amy Patterson. And Amy is our data guru, and she's going to talk about managing data quality and reporting. Now, remember our objective, and we're talking about supporting students and supporting educators. And yes, there is a connection between the quality and type of reporting, the data collection that you folks do and will be doing uh, in both your role as early childhood consultant or director, and also as the director of special education. So uh, they, will, they will flesh that out for you, but I do want you to kind of keep in mind, yes, there is, there are, there are humans behind these numbers. So uh, any questions about that? Uh, the rule of two feet is in place. We ask that you turn your camera off. And uh, again, the chat is available and uh, we'll try to work with questions as, uh, as in as real time as we possibly can. So uh, look forward to a great, great couple of hours together. And uh, without, you, further, without further to, to do, I'm going to shut this down. Yes, I'm sorry. Hi, Pete. This is Bill. Um, Chris has a message in the chat wondering if you could enlarge the screen. Um, Actually, Bill, that wasn't for Pete so much as it was for the participants is how they can enlarge uh, very it good. on their own end. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Pete. OK. My piece of the puzzle is. Down for a little while. All right, good morning. I think I'm up next. Is that correct? Yes. 
All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Thomas Williams, and as you know, Pete just stated, I am uh, the policy advisor with the Office of Special Education and Early Learning, and I'm supporting uh, this wonderful and great initiative um, with Kentucky Leads. So today I have the opportunity to um, to just review and kind of go over um, some uh, scholar responsibilities and also norms. And so I'm going to share my screen or attempt to do that. Um, I'm still a novice when it comes to teams, so please be patient with me. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. thank you. All right, so I'm not going to read all of this, um, but what I will, um, you know, what I will say is that uh, after uh, I believe after today or after the seminar um, on today, um, it'll be uploaded in your um, in the SharePoint. So please feel free to to go to SharePoint and read during your leisure, during your free time. So um, I do kind of want we do want to review the uh, the group norms. Uh, and so the group norms, uh, the first one is to participate respectively. So we would like for everyone to you know engage you know in conversation as the presenters are here. If you have any questions. Uh, you know, please feel free to, to ask those questions anytime um, throughout the seminar. Uh, be considerate and welcome multiple, you know, viewpoints. We all come from, uh, you know, different places in our lives and different lived experiences, but we want to make sure um, that we are professional and we're respectful uh, uh, every Saturday or the Saturdays that we meet. Um, so devote your attention to those speaking and sharing. So we would like for you all to, um, you know, uh, just, Although you know your cameras are off, we we do want you to you know pay attention and because it's it's really good information that uh, the presenters are presenting and we just we really want you to be engaged and and kind of uh, and paying attention you know as the presenters are presenting. Ask questions for clarification. So anytime throughout the the seminar where you have any questions or you need any clarity, please feel free to uh, to either put that information into the chat box or raise your hand and, um, and, and unmute to ask your question. If for any reason that, you know, sometimes everyone's different uh, and some may not want to ask a question um, in the whole group, please feel free to email us and we'll definitely, um, we'll definitely uh, answer your questions. Um, be courageous to speak your truth. Uh, we're all professionals. Um, and again, you know, speak your truth because again, in order for us to move forward, we have to, you know, be honest um, uh, we have to be honest. Own your intentions and your impacts and honor our time together. So uh, again, we're here for two hours of 10 to 12. Um, so, you know, we want you to fully uh, be fully engaged uh, and, 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 and protect this time here um, that we have with each, with each other. Because again, we're only meeting once a month uh, for two hours on a Saturday. So uh, we want to make sure that we're honoring our time and we have, you know, devoted, um, uh, time into the two hours. So the next thing that I want to highlight, and I'll I'll scroll down, are the scholar responsibilities. So again, I'm not going to read through all of this, but I will highlight a few things uh, that we want you all to pay close attention to. Um, so <clears throat> there are two things that I want to highlight um, um, in the scholar responsibilities, and that is the enrollment of the university. So if you are not enrolled in a university um, to date, you have um, six months you know, to enroll. So Pete and myself, for those who have not enrolled, Pete and myself will be reaching out to you to see what we can do to support you um, to get enrolled, okay? So if you have not enrolled, you have six months uh, to be enrolled, uh, but, you know, be expecting a, just a one-on-one -on -one with Pete and myself so we can just see how we can better support you. The next thing is, is that we have 20 sessions, 20 Saturday sessions um, um, that you will, or that we will participate in. Um, and throughout the 20 sessions, we are um, going to um, ask you not to miss more than three absences per year, okay? Now, we do know that uh, we are human, things do come up, uh, but we are, you know, really asking that uh, that um, you only have three absences per year. Um, if for any reason that uh, you have to miss, please contact Pete. Um, uh, just send him an email, and I, I think you all should have his email address, and we will, uh, we'll, you know, make sure that you receive any information that you uh, may have missed. So again, um, the absences is three per year. The year starts in February, so uh, the February of each year uh, that starts a new year. So you have three absences 
uh, per year. So those are the things that uh, I wanted to highlight also to take advantage of the technical assistance and support. So again, I'm not going to read through all of this. Uh, please um, go through it uh, during your leisure. If you have any questions about um, anything after you, because I know sometimes when you read things, you may have questions because I did go over everything really quickly. Please feel free to send, a, uh, send us an email if you need clarification uh, around the document. And again, that information will be shared in, um, in SharePoint. Do, does anyone have any questions for me? All right, I don't see any. I think I did a good job. All right, no questions. But again, you know, please feel free to uh, to reach out <clears throat> after you read the document uh, for any questions or clarification. And Pete and myself will be reaching out to um, those who have not enrolled. So maybe in the next month or so, we'll be reaching out to those who have not enrolled to see what we can do um, to support you to make sure that you get enrolled uh, within the six months. And so I will turn it back over to Pete uh, to keep our agenda um, going. But again, uh, welcome. And I look forward to learning uh, with you today. Thank you, Dr. Williams. As you said, good job, no questions. <laughs> so our, our next item on the agenda is uh, Kathy Anderson. And Kathy is going to give us some exciting uh, information regarding technology. And uh, Kathy, without further ado, Okay, good morning everybody. So I don't know how many of you have used forms or not. If you would just type over in the chat yeah, that you have or you haven't, just uh, so give me a feeling of who's used forms or at the top of your uh, thing there, you may have also seen like a little thumbs up. Okay, cool. All right, well I'm glad so many of you've used it. If you haven't used it, um, let me just share my screen with you here, if I can get to my button over here. It's really simple to use. There's different ways to, to get to it. Um, what you do is you log into your web version of your Outlook, and when you do that, you'll see up in the top left-hand corner. Let me just wait a minute. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Pete, can you see my screen? Yes. In the top uh, left-hand corner, there's this little these three little buttons over here. And what you do is you click on the buttons, and it gives you lots of uh, options. And so forms is one of those options here. You can see it right here. And you can see there's all different types of things. There's Padlet there. Uh, but this is how you get to, this is how I get to forms. You may have a different way of getting there. You know, there's always more than one way to skin a cat, my dad used to say. So today we're just going to just kind of take a kind of poll of some things. Uh, one of the things we want to do is we want to get our um, cohort team name. And so over here in the chat, stop sharing. I'm going to put uh, a link to our cohort team na name that you can choose. And give me just a second and I'll put that link over there. Make sure everybody can respond today. That's always a good thing for people to be able to respond, right? All right, so I have put that link for our cohort team names. So what is your favorite cohort team name suggestion? And if I can jump in really quickly, Kathy, yes. uh, these yes. these um, cohort names were submitted to, uh, to Beckham. So these are the names that were uh, submitted, the, the cohort names that were submitted that's going into the poll. Right. All right. I think I can share the responses here so you can see them. Got a little graphic going there. Drum like roll. Pink. What do we have? Well, still still spinning. Looks like we got team okay. seed with five so far though. All right, give everybody another five seconds or so to respond. <laughs> All right, has everybody had a chance to respond? Got 13 responses. It's like it slowed down. 
looks like our our team name may be team seed team is, seed congratulations yeah. yay yeah, that's good. <laughs> Do I get a prize? <laughs> yeah. Free tattoos for everybody. <laughs> Ooh, that's funny. Right. <laughs> All right. Cool. That's exciting. That's exciting. So it, it, the inaugural cohort one um, name is Team Seed. So that's very exciting. Yeah. Yes. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. So as you know, Chris Thacker is going to be sharing some really interesting information with you about funding. I know when I first came to the department, I knew nothing, nothing about um, IDEA very much or especially about the funding side. So I think you will find uh, Chris's um, information to be very, very interesting. So I've got a couple of questions for uh, Chris uh, gets into his presentation and then uh, Pete, should I wait around and for uh, Amy to do her presentation so I do her questions before her um, her presentation? I don't think it's listed on the yeah. agenda that way. You are correct, but yes, if you would please, if you if you don't care, if you don't yeah. mind, that'd be wonderful. I would love to, love Thank to. You. So we've got some questions here about funding to see what you know. I'm going to pop that link into the chat here. So give me just a second. I'll share that with you. All right, so here are some questions. How does Kentucky fund local district special education programs? A little short answer there. And then number two, how may a district use funds awarded under Part B of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act? All right, so. I'll give you a couple of, uh, about a minute or so to answer those questions there, and then we'll look at the responses. I feel like we need some Jeopardy music, Thomas. You know, and I was thinking oh, you about want to share that screen so we can see live no. action or. Yeah, I will. I'm just now getting some <laughs> live action, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, sorry to interrupt, but I was wondering where uh, this is because I'm not finding it. And put it course, in the chat. I can put it in there again, yeah. Stacy. Thanks. Sure, I'm no problem. in the middle of nine things going on and I'm trying to find everything. No, my hot surely not. And, <laughs> do you see the forms link now, Stacy? I do now. Thank you. Cool. Appreciate no problem. It. All right. We got six responses there on the chart. All right. Can everybody see those? Mm. Mm, lots of different answers for number one there, Chris. It looks like the Rainbow Coalition. <laughs> and number two. A lot of got a couple of people saying to pay the excess cost to provide. Mm, now the blue one's getting more action. It's a top question. December one count. It looks like the the first two responses are essentially the same that are in that first question, just different names for it, and the the fourth one is the same as well. They're just using different words to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, we got 11 responses. I think we need to wait for about three more people to respond. Seems like we had about 14 people respond last time. So give everybody about another 10 seconds and then we'll roll it over to you, Chris. Okay. Well, the good thing is on that first question, which is an open response, there's no real definitive single answer that works. So most of what I'm seeing there are actual uh, uh, correct answers. Uh, as far as the technicality of it, yeah, we do use child count for, for the state to do that. The question as it, as it was written it, is how does the state fund special education? So a little bit of a misdirection there. The state 
is state dollars. Federal dollars would be the IDA that we're looking at there. One could say, though, and be, be correct in saying so, that the state receives the federal grant and then allocates that out through, uh, through GMAPs, through an application process. So essentially, the state allocates the federal funds as well. But very good responses there. and glad to see that you, you are all engaged and, and, and aware of what's going on around you and that child count plays a major role in, uh, in funding. We'll get into that a little more later. And as to the second question, there really is only one correct answer there, and that is the third one, and that is to pay the excess cost to provide special education related services to children with disabilities. There may be some rare exceptions to that, and we'll get into that a little bit later once the uh, the actual presentation starts. So thank you so much for your responses and good to see that everybody has some real good awareness around funding. And so that should make what we're going to be doing here work out pretty well. Okay, let me see if I can now share my screen and go to my PowerPoint. For whatever reason, it's not letting me show the PowerPoint. Do you see my PowerPoint? No. Let me try it again. Okay, share. It says no files available for my PowerPoint to share. Maybe I need to close it down and open it back up. Chris, I, I have a copy of it if, if needed. Just let me know. Let me try one more time here and see if it'll, if it'll pop up for me. Yeah, it's not going to let me. It keeps saying, oh, wait, wait, wait. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay. I wanted to click the full screen here and see if that makes it bigger. Do you still see it in the full screen now, or do you still see the slides off to the side? It's full screen. Full screen. Okay. Great, great. Uh, welcome, everyone. As Pete said, my name is Chris Thacker, and uh, I work for the Human Development Institute out of the University of Kentucky and I had a couple of assignments there. Uh, one of my assignments is working for the IDEA Data Center, which is a federally funded technical assistance center around data, but oddly enough, today I'm presenting on finance. Another one of my assignments is to work with the Kentucky Department of Education, where I, I spent the vast part of my career being the Part B data manager and financial person with, with regards to special education issues. So I do have the background in working with both data and finance. And today's topic for me will be finance. And coming up later today will be Amy Patterson, who is the now Part B data manager for Kentucky, and she'll go over a few things. So as we go through the process, uh, Bill has accepted the responsibility to kind of keep up with the chat. And if you have questions that you want to pose as we're going through there, he'll read and interpret them. If you have just a burning question that you just want an immediate response to, I'm not opposed to you unmuting yourself if that's allowable here and, and asking that question in the middle of the session. We, it shouldn't get us too confused. And as Pete said, the topic today is special education finance. I kind of changed the name of it a little bit and called it Show Me the Money just because I loved that movie and thought it was great. First, I want to talk about the uh, Office of Special Education and Early Learning, OSIL, which is the office at the Kentucky Department of Education that is responsible for all things special education, as well as a few other programs as well. Obviously, early learning is in that, and I think Kathy is gifted and talented. It's still in there, or, uh, and maybe a couple other uh, programs as well. But obviously, we're going to be focusing on special education. This little diagram here looks at the OCL leadership team. There are three divisions within OCL, but there's also the leadership team at, at OCL, which kind of uh, looks at these major areas here, data, finance, setting policy, working with various advisory groups. The divisions work more with programmatic and co compliance types of issues and technical assistance and professional development in those areas. So my contract, I work primarily with OCL leadership team around finance and data, though I do get a, a, a involved sometimes with policy because finance and data, as you can see, feeds into policy and policy ultimately feeds back into the others as well. 
This is the OCL fiscal team. We have Pamela, Pamela Ayer, or Pam Ayer as we call her, uh, Jonathan Compton, Carla Miller, and myself, and we work with districts on a regular basis on, on financial issues. For today's agenda, I'm going to be talking, first give you the objectives to this, then we're going to look about how Kentucky funds special education, then we'll look at the federal support for special education, some of the fiscal requirements under the IDEA, and then we'll look at some fiscal terminology that is used in the IDEA. Other federal programs use uh, fiscal terminology that, that's, that's similar. Some of ours are a little bit different, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little later in today's session. So what are the objectives? Kentucky Lead Scholars will uh, achieve these four things, or at least that's my hope. At the end of this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of these four items. Pretty much follows the agenda for those that are, that are paying close attention. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. And how does Kentucky fund special education? Well, we've hinted at it a little bit when we've talked about the fact that there are state funds and that there are federal funds. One of the things in the state funds is the, the SEEK funding formula. And SEEK has been around since right shortly after CARA, the Kentucky Education Reform Act that happened in the early 1990 uh, year. And it was uh, actually the reason why CARA came about because uh, many uh, districts sued the state for not equally funding special or education across the state. So that law came about and it created the SEEK funding formula, which stands for Supporting Education Excellence in Kentucky. The general education funding component of that is based on membership or attendance. Then there is an add-on for SEEK, SEEK, it's called the SEEK Exceptional Child Add-on, and that uses the child count that we talked about a while ago. I will be, uh, sure to mention, or need to be sure to mention that a special education student is first a general education student. So as a general education student, that child or student is generating the base formula that all kids generate. In addition to that, the special education student also generates for the district the, the Seek Exceptional Child add-on funds. So it's a, it's a double whammy, if you will. Uh, you get extra money in this regard. It's also important to note that that when we look at how that it's funded, that different disabilities get a, a different amount. But we'll go into that a little further later. We also have preschool state funds. And you might be wondering, why am I including that in special education? Well, because there's two ways to get into preschool. There's the four-year-old at-risk program, and Bill can tell you all about that. But there's also included in that three, four, and even five-year-old kids with disabilities, I think it includes five-year-olds with disabilities who are not yet in kindergarten, that can qualify to be in that program as well. And there's funding specifically for those children. However, if you are a child with a disability that's three or four, or four years old and at risk, you are entitled to be in that program and be provided services from that four-year-old at risk pool uh, first. And then we would look to see if, if, you, if you're not at risk, then qualify you under the disability categories. The next, oops, the next is the federal funds. And I've got, pardon my student, okay. The federal funds, the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs is another one of those acronyms that Pete talked about at the beginning, OSEP, annually, annually awards to states across the, the nation federal funds under Part B of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. There are the Section 611 funds, which in Kentucky we often refer to those as the basic IDA funds. And you'll notice it's for ages 3 through 21. It's sometimes referred to as the school age program, even though it's inclusive of three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, all the way through 21. And then there is additional funding called Section 619 for preschool, and that is funding specifically for ages 3 through 5. So we've looked at several different funding uh, that local districts get. We've got the, the base SEEK, the SEEK Exceptional Child Add-on, the preschool funds, then these two IDEA funds that are out there. And yes, three, four, and five-year-olds get funding for both 611 and 619. I put state first here for a reason. A lot of times, and when we read that uh, this, those answers a while ago, 
a lot of people refer to the IDA funds, the IDA funds, the IDA funds. Yeah, the IDA funds are primarily what funds the OSIL, the staff there. But when we, with regards to funding local districts and their programs for special education, SEEK exceptional child add-on by far outweighs the amount of money that districts get for providing special education and related services to children with disabilities. We mentioned a while ago that it was based on child count and disabilities. It is a weighted formula and it is only for children on the count who are ages five through 20. That's because in Kentucky, when we look at funding elementary and secondary education, those are the ages that the state funds. You can still be a 21 year old because IDA goes through 21, but it, the seat funding doesn't fund pre-K. It's for K and above, and we distinguish that by using age five through 20. So when we look at that IDA child count from a district, it will be for ages three through 21. So we have to exclude the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds, and the 21-year-olds from those counts. And you can see we've got three separate weight categories. The first weight category or of high incidence only includes those kids whose disability is speech. No other disability. That's their primary disability, and that's how they're included on the child count. Those students have a weight of 0 0.24. The next weight is called the moderate incidence weight, and there are five disability categories there. I'm not going to read them for you. I'm sure you can see what those five are, and they have a weight of 1.17. The last category called the low incidence weight is 2.35. And as you look at those disabilities, you will see that, that uh, they are disabilities that primarily take more resources to provide service to, generally speaking, than the, than the students in the moderate incidence rate there. So keep those weights in mind because they come into play. So now that we know what the weights are, how do we use that information to fund under the Seek Exceptional Child add-on? One of the things that are in the, uh, the Google Drive, or Bill might be able to correct me, the, the place where information is stored for you, we uploaded a copy of this that lists the seven steps. First step, obviously, is we have to do the count. We've already talked about including only from that count children who are ages 5 through 20. Then we have to group those students from the child count into the three separate weight categories that we gave. Then we have to calculate a subtotal of the counts for each weight so that we've got three weights. Well, how many students were there in each of those three weights? Then we multiply the count of each of those uh, three weights by what their weight is. We sum those three weights together, and then we multiply that sum times the guaranteed base amount per child to get what the Seek Exceptional Child add-on funds are. Realizing that that's a pretty involved process that we're talking about there, I thought I'd create a little bit of an exercise for us to, uh, to do. So right now on your screen is the actual child count from a district on December 1, 2020. I've gone ahead and separated it by the high incidence, the moderate incidence, and the low incidence so that you can see how many children there are in each disability category and what the weights are for each of those. So if I go back to the previous screen, we're going to be doing steps four, five, and six here. So I want to give you a couple of minutes using the information that you see on your screen here to get to the step six, sum of the three weighted subtotals. So that once we know what each individual uh, weight is, that we add all of those together. Chris, I have a question before sure. we do this, um, because I know in Kentucky, uh, kindergarten funding is half day. So those kids that are uh, five years old, they're typically in kindergarten. Is there a different formula uh, that we use in order to um, calculate the half day kindergarten and then the full day student attendance from first, uh, first grade to 12th grade? That's an excellent question, Stacy. With regards to the Seek Exceptional Child add-on, it does not consider that at all. 
if you were included on the child count in for a half day program. If you were a five year old child with a disability and have an IEP, then yes, you're going to be included on the child count. Then you you're a full weighted child based upon your whatever your disability is. Preschool might look at it a little different. Bill would have to answer that question because that's a little bit out of my realm. So let's go ahead and start posting uh, your answers in one minute in the chat so that we can see where we are. While you're doing your computations, you might be wondering how did we come up with those three different weights of 0 0.24, 1.17, and 2.35. Uh, that, that's a great thing to think about because it is it does just look to be arbitrary, but actually it isn't too arbitrary. The reason I say that is years ago, before the SEEK funding formula went into place, local districts were uh, funded for all of their classrooms, not just special education, but special education as well, through what was called minimum foundation units. And those minimum foundation units were funded based upon the number of students uh, with particular disability categories, so that a, a teacher or a special education unit that was for a separate class for uh, what would be FMD students today or multiple disability students might require six students to generate funding, whereas a LBD classroom or a typical resource room that we think of today might take 12 students. And for a speech pathologist, I think it was 60 students or 75, somewhere around that, that ultimately generated a unit for speech. And so we worked with an organization at that time out of uh, Stanford University uh, called AIR, and they work with us to generate these these weights, and that's how we came up with the 0 0.24, the 1.17, and the 2.35. You'll notice that the 1.17 is just shy of half the weight of 2.35. So that would coincide with the number of six kids it took to fund a unit under the foundation program versus 12 uh, students that it took to fund a moderate incidence classroom back in the day. So there's some historical perspective here. We've reviewed this, I think, once since this was set up. And I think we moved a couple of disability categories from the moderate to the low incidence. And it is obviously doing so made more money available at, at the local level. There has not been any discussion of late about any changes to this funding formula. It's been in place for I don't know, nearly 30 years now, 28, something like that. Okay. okay, for the high incidence rate, there were 16 speech kids. The weight for speech, 0 0.24. The weighted count for speech or high incidence was 3.84. For moderate incidence, there are five disability categories. We had a total of 11 students with disabilities there, 11 times. I says 1.14, that should say 1.17. I didn't catch that error until just now looking at it. But the weight is correct, I think. The low incidence category has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different disabilities. And there are nine students in that. We multiply the nine times the 2.35, and that gets us to 21.15 as the weight. So now we have the three weights. We add those three weights together, and we get 
37.86 as the weighted count for this district that's going to be funded. If we go back to that list, number seven on the list or the steps of how we calculate it, you multiply the 37.86 times the guaranteed base amount per child, and that's what we do next. So we have to know what is our total weighted count? It's 37.86. What is the guaranteed base amount for child? Well, we were putting $4,000 there, but you notice there's an asterisk. This amount changes from year to year. And in the early years, if the year, there was a biennial budget there was in Kentucky that the legislature set, and the biennial budget included in that what the guaranteed base amount for child would be for each year of the biennium. Over time, I think that's changed to where the working with LRC and staff in the Office of uh, Finance here at KDE will come up with that guaranteed base amount per child. And I think it's been $4,000 for the last uh, two, three, maybe even four years uh, because of budgetary concerns. So we multiply that 37.86 times 4,000. So this district would generate $151,440 of SEEK exceptional child add-on funds. Needless to say, it's a relatively small district, but you, you figured that out when you saw the child count numbers that we, we had there. It is a, a very large district. And I intentionally chose a small one so that when we started doing our computations that it wouldn't uh, be difficult to, to achieve those numbers. So this is the state exceptional child add-on funds. It's also important to note that when a district receives the SEEK funding, whether it's the SEEK base or any of the add-ons, it goes into the district's general fund. There is no earmarking of these funds. In other words, that $151,440, it was generated because of the special education students in the district, but when it goes into the general fund, you're not required from the state's perspective to spend that specifically on students with disabilities. Your need as a district to provide services to students with disabilities is going to necessitate that you spend money from the general fund to provide services. And many times it will be greater than that $151,440 or whatever it is for that individual district. And we'll touch on that here in a little bit when we start talking about federal issues and concerns. So next, let's do look at the federal support for special education. How IDA funds are calculated for, for local districts. The, the formula here was established in the 1997 reauthorization of the IDEA, and it hasn't changed since. Prior to that reauthorization, child count was how federal funds were distributed. Every district, we would look at their child count, and give them a dollar amount for every child on that count, regardless of the disability that they were counted under. So at the federal level, a speech-only kid generated as much IDA funds as the most uh, low incident, most costly child as far as the disability is concerned. It was the same thing. So there was a benefit, if I'm a district, to identify speech kids who cost relatively less to provide services to and maybe let's say a FMD student who was more involved and required a lot more services. So there was the reason that the reauthorization came around to change that formula was that the thought was that it was providing some incentive to identify some students on the lower end that as far as needing services to make up for the services, more services needed on the uh, uh, low incidence population program. So that formula established a base amount back then when it was first set in place so that in Kentucky we had to look at what our allocation was and determine on the old methodology per child how much each district would get and that became that district's base allocation so every year since then that district has started out with that same dollar amount of federal funds doesn't change unless a district is created and in Kentucky the only way to do that is through charter schools now or if a district dissolves and we have had a couple of districts dissolve over the last four or five years that the independent 
small city school has uh, combined with the county district. And so now what we have to do is take that district base of the district that was dissolving and just add it to the base of the district it joined with. So the other districts, their base didn't get impacted, just those two districts. If we were to add a district, then we would have to look at potentially reallocating bases in a, in a broader area. But that's getting into the weeds and, and something you wouldn't have to do as a local district uh, person. So in addition to that base amount that, like I said, never changes from year to year, we add funds for population or membership and notice it says for all K-12 students. This isn't just for students with disabilities. We look at the total membership of every student in elementary and secondary schools in that district, both the public schools and any private schools located in that district. And private includes for, uh, parochial and home schools in addition to any other types of private schools that, that might be operating there. You'll notice it says 85% at the end of that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that here in just a minute. But the final piece is the poverty index. So we have to fund based upon a poverty rate for each individual district. And that is done in Kentucky and many other states by looking at the number of students who are eligible for a free or reduced meal. And you see the 15% there. So what does that 85% and 15% mean? But when we get the allocation from the federal government each year, it tells us how much we have to uh, award to school districts across the state. From that amount, we subtract the base amount and the difference between the base amount and what we still have to allocate to diff districts are based upon population and poverty. 85% of that additional funds that we have to allocate to districts has to go out based upon population and membership. The remaining 15% has to go out based upon poverty. <clears throat> so what it ends up being is we have a child count for every district of, their, of its membership for all of these programs. We get that from, a, uh, I think it's the attendance report that superintendents send in and uh, it used to be called the growth factor report and now I think it, there's another report that exists out there so annually sometime in October every district reports all the kids that they have later in the school year there's something called declaration of participation that counts all students that are in private parochial or home schools located within their jurisdiction so we get that grand total and divide it into whatever that 85 percent is that we have to flow through to get a per child amount and often that's not going to be an even dollar amount so we take it to you know like five hundred dollars and 84 cents that may be the amount that we allocate then we look at the poverty index and we count every district's number of students who were eligible for free or reduced meal Many districts use that community program where all kids may actually end up getting the free or reduced meal, but there still has to be the measurement or the testing to find out individually those kids that would qualify. And there's a report that goes to the federal government on that as well. And that is the number that we use for that. So we come up with a per child amount there as well for the district. Then we add all three of those amounts together. And at that point, when we add all three of those amounts together, we'll round it off to the nearest whole dollar. And that's how the federal funds are allocated. We do that for both the Section 611 funds and the 619 preschool. Preschool is a much smaller pot. The base amount for preschool is a much smaller amount, but it is the same each year unless something happens as indicated there. So the same process occurs. For population, we still use that same count of students that we used for the basic grant that we were talking about. It's just going to end up being a much smaller number. Same for poverty. We use the same count of poverty students. Again, it's just a much less amount. So what are a few of the IDA fiscal requirements? I didn't want to list here regulations and every potential requirement that, that happens out there. 
I tried to think with, with regards to our scholars here, we are uh, pursuing a, an advanced degree and maybe hope to be a director of special education someday working in a local school district. And I kind of tried to focus it around that. What generally do I need to know as the director of special education around fiscal requirements? Obviously, you want to have to work with the fiscal people at your local district to make sure that the records are kept and documentation kept and, and all of those appropriate things are done for any accounts that you have. <clears throat> but that is also true with the IDA funds. Under the IDA, you might hear people talk about MOE, and MOE refers to maintenance of effort. So maintenance of effort requirements are a vital part of the IDA. In fact, it gets done twice, once as a part of uh, eligibility, which looks at how much money you budgeted, and once for compliance, where it looks at how much money you spent. The first one here we talked about is eligibility. You have to be eligible to receive funds. To be eligible, you have to budget enough of your state and local dollars to provide special education to be eligible to receive the IDA funds. Districts must meet the IDA's excess costs. And we talked about excess costs in that pretest question that was the right answer. And you might be wondering what is excess costs, and we'll get into that a little bit later as well. IDA funds are available for obligation for up to 27 months, and you have 90 additional uh, days to liquidate any obligations made in those 27 months that were not paid at the end of that 27 months. So typically July 1 of each year, that's the federal, uh, when the federal allocation becomes available. 27 months is two years and three months later on September 30th. That period to spend those funds, to obligate those funds, expires. We may have been billed for a service within that seven months or ordered some, some things where we've obligated ourselves to pay for them, but we haven't got the bill yet from the vendor, so we, we haven't yet spent the funds as far as writing the check. You have 90 days after September 30th. That puts you somewhere between Christmas and New Year because of the 31, 30, 31 days in the month. It puts you at December 29th, technically speaking. So at that point, if you've not paid, cashed out that obligation, then any unspent funds at that time have to be returned to the U.S. Department of Education. Very rarely does that happen. And one of the reasons it doesn't happen is obviously districts are spending money all the time. You get this allocation every year on July 1. So you could have potentially three funds from July 1 to September 30th. You could have the new funds that you just got, the funds from a year ago that still have 15 months left, and the funds from two years ago that had three months left in that period of obligation. Most of the time when we look at information or data from local districts, they'll spend their entire allocation anywhere from 15 months to 18 months to, to 21 months. Very rare that it goes to 21 months. Rare still that it goes beyond that. Obviously, right now we're in the middle of a pandemic and things changed quite a bit last school year and this school year. Uh, in the U.S. Department of Education allowed for the funds that would have expired on September 30th, 2020, so six months or so ago, it allowed an additional 12 months for those funds. For the funds that would normally expire on September 30th, 2021, this year, they've not extended those funds, or at least they haven't done so as yet. So right now, we've got two pots of money that are going to expire on September 30th, uh, 2021. And oddly enough, we do have some districts that still have not spent all of those funds. I have not looked at it recently to know how many and if it's from both years of funds or just the, just the uh, one, but it is a concern. And we've had that same concern or that same requirement at the state level in spending funds as well. You have to have a clear audit trail of how you use those funds. Notice I said in the parens there, they cannot be co-mingled. Co-mingled doesn't mean they can't be put in the same bank account. It means you have to just have a separate accounting for those funds so that if I spent 
$68.94 to buy supplies for the special education classroom and charge it to the IDA budget, then I'm going to subtract that $68.94 from whatever my allocation was that year. So as long as you can say I've got that 150, let's say I have $150,000 of federal funds, as long as I can track how I spent that $150,000 that was awarded to me on July 1 of whatever year and balance it out and have documentation for invoices or whatever is necessary, then I'm generally going to be okay. But in all likelihood, there is just one maybe general fund bank account somewhere that exists. But through a program called Munis that every district in the state uses, you're able to assign templates to every financial transaction that assigns expenditures to the appropriate grant. And that's very important to keep up with. That's one of the things that gets monitored. So make sure that you're aware of that. That's something that the finance officer will do. But as the director of special education, these IDA funds are the funds that you will probably most likely use in your day-to-day -day operations of activity. So you need to be aware of how much you have at any given time. Districts may only use IDA funds for school-age children to pay for the excess costs of providing special education and related services. And I specifically put in school age because that refers to students who are in grades K through 12 because excess cost applies to that group. It doesn't apply to preschool. And again, we'll talk about that a little later as well. Districts must set aside a proportionate share of its IDA allocations to provide services to children with disabilities enrolled in private elementary and secondary schools, <clears throat> and that includes home schools. When I say elementary and secondary schools, that only includes K through 12. As far as private elementary and secondary schools, a private preschool is not considered under this uh, uh, share for the private school proportion amount. Districts must report to the state on at least a quarterly basis the expenditure of IDA funds. So every three months at the end of the calendar quarter, and the calendar quarter ends September 30th, December 31, March 31, and June 30th. I think within the next month after each quarter ends, the district has to send in a report by Munis code, the budget that was approved, how much funds you spent that quarter and cumulatively year to date, and then a balance of how much you have left of those funds. And that's how we know whether you spent them out in that 27 month period. And that's how we know that you usually spend them in 15 months or 18 months or 21 months. Districts that fail to meet the IDA's maintenance of effort compliance requirements will have to repay the amount of the failure. Earlier I talked about MOE with regards to eligibility and that was the budgeted piece that you have to budget the appropriate amounts to be eligible to receive the monies. Once you've done that and you're eligible to receive the monies, then we come back and look, did you actually spend as much money as you were supposed to spend to meet that maintenance of effort requirement? And if you didn't, the state has to pay back to the federal government however much you failed to meet that requirement. Now, it sounds, oh, that's great the state to do that, but in, the state will then come to the district and probably withhold a portion of your seek exceptional child add-on funds or, or some other source to make itself whole. So it's ultimately coming out of your funds, but the state's the one who is charged by the federal government to actually have to pay that back. <clears throat> so that's something that we keep a very close eye on from year to year. Chris, Districts is, that have seen, yes. Hi, Chris, this is Bill. Um, you have a question in the chat uh, from Amy about the set aside. So how do you determine the proportion amount you would need to set aside? Excellent. Very good question. Each year in the GMAC program where you apply for this grant, the district has to provide them in a section that speaks to private schools, numbers of students that they have. And I don't have GMAP opened up, so I can't describe it exactly the way it lists there. But essentially what we look at is how many kids are there that are eligible for special education? And generally that'll be your child count. Out of those numbers of kids, how many of them are attending a private school? And a lot of times that will be on, on your child count, you have to tell whether they were uh, parentally placed in a private school program. There's a 
third piece that is outside of the child count. That's a child who's eligible for special education because the ARC team in Kentucky determined them eligible. But for whatever reason, the parents have refused to those services. We have to look at the number of students who are eligible. So it's the child count plus everyone eligible, whether they're in your public schools or your private schools, that is in grades K through 12, that is your universe. Then you look at how many of those are in private schools and what percentage is that count of all of your universe. And then that's the amount that you as a district would have to set aside. But when you enter those numbers into GMAP, it will automatically calculate that for you. And then when you get to the section in GMAP where you are budgeting funds, there's a budget specifically for the private school proportion amount, you'll have that there and you'll know how much that you have to budget for that activity. Great question, maybe not so great an answer. Any follow-up on that? I realize that we're going through what I would call a sit and get, and it gets very uh, hard to keep up with the nuances of things we're talking about. That's one of the reasons why this uh, PowerPoint has been made available to you. It's a lot to keep up with. And the, unfortunately, there's not many ways to to make it interactive to to in the short time that we have to make it more meaningful to you. The next piece has to do with significant disproportionality in either the identification of a child with a disability or of any in, in certain specific disability categories, the placement of children with disabilities, or in the discipline of children with disabilities. And when we look at significant disproportionality here, we're looking at by race. Are we identifying in any of these three or four areas that we talked about here, students of one particular race category at a rate that is significantly disproportionate to how we identify students for those same outcomes that are of other races? So if that occurs, then you have to set aside 15% of your IDA allocations, both the basic and preschool, to provide comprehensive coordinated early intervening services. And that will be included in your GMAS budget as well if you are having to do that. And you'll have to do exactly the 15% set aside and account for those funds as well. Not too many districts have to do that, fortunately. Now we're going to look at some of the fiscal terminology of the IDA. This is, these are unofficial definitions. Again, I wanted to keep it as, as the narrative as common as I could without getting into a lot of back and forth. But we've talked about excess costs quite extensively here. So what exactly is excess cost? Well, if you want the very prescriptive definition for it, I would suggest that you get the uh, 34 CFR 300 series regulations. And those are the regulations around the implementation of the IDEA. At the very end of those regulations is something called Appendix A. And Appendix A walks through in probably about a two-page process of what excess cost is and how you calculate it. But essentially, to meet excess cost, you have to know for both elementary school kids and secondary school kids, how much money per pupil you're spending to provide them general education from state and local funds. And a lot of times that, that amount is around the $6,000 to, $6, to $8,000 range. Some districts are a little higher, some districts obviously a little lower. I think on the very extreme end, we've got some districts that hit ten, maybe even $11,000. On the low end, we might have five or $6,000 as far as those numbers. But it's unique to each individual district, and it's separate for both elementary and secondary. So you might have a $10,000 secondary and a $8,000 elementary amount or per pupil expenditure. What excess cost says is that you will spend that much state and local funds providing general education to students with disabilities before or prior to using IDEA funds to provide special education and related services to children with disabilities. That's the concept behind it. That's what it means. How that is measured and determined is almost impossible. We can calculate what that amount is, but determining whether you did it or didn't do it is next to impossible 
because we don't collect expenditures on a per pupil basis. So it's averages. So once you come up with that average, it isn't differentiated between a special education student and a non-special education student. So it, it's, it's a figure that's out there that is something that you have to meet to qualify for the funds, much like the MOE eligibility piece, but it's very hard to explain. Just know that your special education students are first and foremost general education students and are entitled to the same general education from state and local resources as any other general education student in the district. And if you're not doing that, then you're violating the spirit and essence of what excess cost is all about. Maintenance of effort, another term that we've talked about quite extensively, and I'll often refer to as MOE, where excess costs looks at how much money you spent providing general education students to, uh, uh, or general education to students with disabilities. Maintenance of effort now looks at how much state and local money uh, funds you're spending providing those same students special education. And the word maintenance is a clue. You have to maintain that amount of state and local funds that you spent providing special education previously each year or increase it. In other words, you can't let it go down. So if I spent a million dollars in 2018-19 providing special education, then I have to at least spend a million dollars in 1920 providing special education and related services. That's about as simple as I know how to describe it. There are some exceptions and adjustments that will allow that million dollars to be reduced for specific concerns. Uh, and we might, we might talk about those later if we have, have time. What goes along with maintenance of effort is supplanting. The phrase here is supplement, not supplant. IDA funds may be used to supplement local or state and local funds. A district spends to provide special education and related services. However, it cannot supplant those funds. That means you can't take a, a let's look at a particular cost, for example. Suppose we have a special education teacher that's paid out of state and local funds, and now we want to pay for them with IDA funds. That's supplanting at the particular cost level. That requirement went away. But if in doing that type of particular cost of planting that reduced the million dollars that I was spending to state and local funds, then I've supplanted and violated the supplanting MOE requirement. So I can supplant on a particular cost as long as I don't reduce the total of state and local funds that I spent. At one time, you couldn't supplant on a particular cost. Once that special education teacher was paid out of state and local funds, they had to always be paid for out of state and local funds. I think that went away with the 97 amendments also. So it's easier to, to meet now or more flexibility to meet now as long as you're maintaining and sustaining that overall total. There are actually four tests that come into play to measure maintenance of effort. And you'll look at that second line up there. I said local or state and local funds. The four tests look at local by itself and then looks at state and local combined. Well, in Kentucky, we have a general fund that has local funds in it and state funds in it. So we don't have in our municipal accounting system any template that identifies an expenditure as local. It just identifies it as coming from the general fund and maybe from whatever program or, or things like that. But the local or state uh, source of those funds get lost in Munis. So how do we do that in Kentucky? Go back to the Seek Exceptional Child add-on fund. Those are state funds specifically for special education. And I noted that many districts will spend more than the Seek Exceptional Child add-on funds that they receive to provide services to kids. So what we do in Kentucky is you spend your state exceptional child add-on funds first when providing special education for purposes of maintenance of effort. So when we look to see how much of your general fund dollars were spent providing special education and related services, and that is tracked, 
we look at that total. Is it greater than the seek exceptional child add-on? If so, anything above that seek exceptional child add-on is considered local expenditures. If it's less, then all you spent was state funds. So that's how we differentiate between local only, which is the excess of the seek exceptional child add-on expenditure, or a combination of state and local, which is the grand total. There isn't a test that looks at state only. So we look at that grand total, that's two tests, grand total of local funds only, grand total of state and local funds combined. The other two tests look at it on a per pupil basis. How much was the average per pupil for local funds only, the average of the state and local funds only. So those are the four tests. You can meet any one of those four tests and meet the maintenance of effort requirements. So it gives you a, a very good option or opportunity to meet the requirement, but it is pretty, pretty solid. I mentioned earlier, there are some exceptions and adjustments that allow that minimum amount to be reduced. And that would include the, the one that we most often look at is voluntary departure of staff, of special education staff who were paid out of state or state or local or state and local funds. So if I have a special education teacher paid out of the general fund who retires, chances are if they retired, they're obviously going to have a lot of experience. So the steps in their salary is going to put them up there. Chances are if they're retiring, they're at least a rank two and maybe even a rank one. So that's going to put them up there. So if I have someone retiring, they may be making just say $55,000 a year as a special education teacher. I might replace that special education teacher with someone that just graduated from college, that has no steps in experience, and may be a rank three. What's the difference between those two salaries? The salary of the person that left voluntarily by retirement and the person who took their place. <clears throat> Whatever that difference is, we can reduce from that million dollars, the example that I used before. Now I don't have to hit a million dollars. It may be that I have to do $9,985,000 because there's a $15,000 difference between those salaries. And in, in districts of any size, you may have two or three people that retire over the course of the year. You may have people who voluntarily depart because they go to another school district or they do something else to, uh, to provide, uh, to leave the district. As long as they do it voluntarily, then you take how much that person made, how much the person that replaced them makes, and that difference is, is an allowable reduction. We look at child count reductions. If your child count goes down, then your amount can go down, and there's, that's done for you mathematically. If you purchase something using state and local funds that you paid for over time and you get it paid for, you can look at that last fiscal year, the payments that went towards that, that item, and that can be a reduction. Or if you have a child who has a very expensive program of, of special education that you're paying for out of state and local dollars, and that child exits the districts and no longer needs that program, the cost of that program can be deducted. So those are the three, the, the several uh, exceptions. An adjustment is if you get an increase in your 611 or basic IDA allocation. If your, if your allocation was $1 million last year, and it's $1,100,000 this year, that's a $100,000 increase, you're entitled to take up to half of that, $50,000, to reduce that million dollars of state funds. You have to be eligible for it. The first thing is there has to be the increase. The second thing is you have to be providing FAPE, and every district is. The third thing is you have to meet your annual determinations, and most districts do. And the fourth thing is you can't be implementing a required comprehensive coordinated early intervening services that school year. So all those things have to be in alignment before you can take advantage of that reduction or that exception. And that pretty much is the gist of what I had to share today about uh, finance and special education. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, to entertain them. Thanks, Chris. There is a question in the chat. And so um, going back a few slides, uh, would it be correct to say if we spend local than state than federal funds? Again, from Amy, if, Amy, if you want to 
if you want to unmute, maybe share a little bit more about that question. Yeah, sorry. I like to ask a lot of questions. Uh, so uh, just okay. as we were listening, it kind of seemed like that maybe that was the order that we would spend the funds. So we would spend our, our general, um, like local money first, and then we would dip into state funding before we would move into our federal funding. Would that be correct? Or do we go from all three pots at the same time? I guess it's kind of what I'm asking. Well, it's, a, it's a good question. And there's there's not a, a a regulatory, I guess, response to it. There is a common practice a, approach to it. When you when you spend funds, you're spending either from your general fund, which can be a combination of state and local, or you're spending from uh, what is often called fund two, which would be your IDA funds. Uh, you want to make sure that whenever you make a decision between those two, what where the expense is going to go, that you're meeting or are going to meet the maintenance of effort requirement. So you know over the course of the year that you're going to have set number of amount of salary that you want to pay, and that may be the primary basis for meeting the state and local funds. So you don't want to interfere with those. But uh, throughout the year, you might need different things. You might want to hire a, a teacher assistant. And so those are things that, yeah, I can accommodate that in my federal fund simply because I know that doing what I plan to do through my budget, I'm going to spend the, the required amount of state and local dollars. So I'm not going to be in, in, a, in a maintenance of effort issue. So I hope that answered your question. I don't know that I hit it. Well, yeah, no, it does. It does. Um, that makes complete sense because we'd have to spend all those state and local funds in order to meet our maintenance of effort, typically, correct? And then we would go into our federal funds. So it doesn't matter how you're, um, I guess, spending it as long as you spend it <laughs> from and, that and one part. That's why you do budget and planning. That's yeah. why before you start spending the money, you have to do a, there's a budget where you do your general fund that you send in each mm -hmm. year. And then when you are applying for your federal funds, whether it's IDA or title or what have you, you've already got your state or your general fund budgeted out for the year. So we're doing, what are the other things that we're going to be doing? Uh, and, and if you follow those plans, hopefully your planning process, especially when it comes to special education, is that you plan to spend enough state and local funds out of the general fund to meet that maintenance of effort requirement, or else it would be poor planning on your part to plan to fail. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. You're welcome. You're mu <clears throat> Next on the agenda would be Amy Patterson going to talk to us about data quality and reporting. So. Hi, um, so my name is Amy Patterson. I am the special ed data manager at Kentucky Department of Education. I just turned on my camera for a second just to uh, just to say hi. Um, and I'm going to um, I'm going to be talking to you about um, data and the, the data we collect at KDE and what we report to the federal government and some ways to use your data within the within your your districts. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them um, as we go. So. Yes. Um, hi, Amy. So Kathy's raised her hand and I, I'm wondering if we want to use the questions at the Padlet activity. Do you want oh, to yeah. Do yeah, or, let's do that. I totally forgot about those. That's OK. I know we're yeah, we're, we're watching time. I, I think we may have time for that. Kathy, what are, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think it will just take a minute or two. So I'll okay. just post the question in the chat real quickly here. It's about data collection just to see what you know. Hope everybody can see that question. Question is, what is the purpose of special education and preschool data collection? Give you a couple of seconds to reply to that form. There's about 14 people, I think. Still waiting for people to reply. People are thinking about the question. 
There you go. Oh, there we go. Got seven responses so far. People are mostly clicking the first answer, which is it to assist in identification. Got nine responses, 10. Just a couple of more seconds, about five more seconds. Then I'll turn it back to you, Amy. All right. So the good news is here, there was no wrong answer. Um, all of those are correct. So the data that we collect and that we report does all three of those things. It assists in identification and prioritization of resources. And that kind of goes along with what Chris was just talking about. Um, it helps us determine funding for the state and the district, and it assists in determining possible student population disproportionality. So those are the and those are things we look at as a state um, and we and the federal government looks at that as well. But there are things that you probably want to be looking at in your district before before we look at them so that you can sort of see trends and, and things that are that are happening. So. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So. Um, was that it, Kathy, or did I have another one? That's all I had for you. Amy. OK, that's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure. OK, so data quality. Um, what is the purpose of all this data we collect? So this is Amy. That's not really me, but you know. Um, Amy loves data, which is a true statement. Amy collects the data from all over the state. Why does Amy care about the data? Yes, it is my job to care about the data, but why do I care? What difference does it make? And the real question is, why should you care about the data? Because th there's all of this data has a lot of information for districts as well as states and, and uh, the federal government um, to make decisions that will help kids improve in you know academically behaviorally social emotional all of that so right now most people look at data use we collect it because we have to report it to the federal government and then we take what we report to the federal government we report it publicly for parents to see we send it to the leg leg legislative research committee to um you know, inform legislators. Uh, we use it for state reporting, which is like score report card. Um, and then maybe if we have time, we use it to make district and school decisions or ARC decisions, maybe. But really, it should be the other way around. ARC decisions, in, decisions about individual students are the most important. That's what the I in IEP stands for. Um, or an IDEA, it's individual. So we really want to be using as much data as possible to make decisions for kids, um, for, for individuals first. And then we can use it to make district and school decisions, state reporting, and so on. And then, yes, we do report it to the federal government. So these are things that you kind of want to be thinking about as we go because a lot of times people don't think about using this data for you know in an arc or i mean they might use like assessment data but they may not use some of the behavior data that comes out or you know those sorts of things so just things to think about as we go so these are the reports that i collect from the districts um Typically, it's the director of special education that submits this data to me. We have the December 1 child count, which is where we get the numbers um, for the SEEK exceptional add-on funds. 
that Chris was just talking about. Um, indicator 11 and 13 data, I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but I'm going to be talking in a little while about the state performance plan annual performance report. Um, and that's indicators 11 and 13 are part of that. Um, indicator 11 specifically is um, when a student is referred and a parent signs consent for evaluation, initial evaluation, um, the district has 60 school days to determine if the student is eligible or not. And if they don't, it, that the time in between the consent and the evaluation are reported to us and we have to determine um, if that was within 60 days. Um, the safe schools report is behavior and the behavior um, should, th this is for all kids ages preschool through grade 14, all of them. Personnel is the uh, special education personnel. Um, and then exiting data is students who are ages 14 to 21 with IEPs at, who exit, either exit special education or exit their district. And that includes graduation, um, dropouts, all of those things. So there's two major data collections that we do. There's a 618 data collection, which is the child count. Um, these were all referred to on the previous slide. Um, we report it in two different collections, students ages 6 through 21 and students ages 3 through 5. Um, actually, now the way we reported it this year is five years old, five year olds in kindergarten were included with the top one with the school age kids. So it's more like kindergarten through grade 14 and pre pre kindergarten preschool. So, and then personnel exiting and discipline are all parts of the section 618 data. So this right here, and I know it's probably kind of hard to see, but this is our child count for the last 10 or 11 years. Um, and I just wanted you guys to take a look at it. The top one, the green, is uh, students ages three through five. And the bottom in the gray is students ages six through 21. And then at the very bottom in the white is the total. So what are some things um, that we notice when we look at this? It's done by disability. So mild mental disability, functional mental disability, um, hearing impaired, speech language, visually impaired, uh, emotional and behavioral uh, disorder, um, orthopedically impaired, other health impaired, um, specific learning disability, deafblind, multiple disabilities, autism, traumatic brain injury, and developmentally delayed. And that's only for students ages um, under age nine. So I see it's increasing. There has been, COVID did impact the students um, identified this year or who were receiving services this year. Yeah, if you notice, especially the three through five count, those numbers, they really dropped by over 3,000 students. Um, so that could, think about the long-term effects of that. What kind of long-term effects could we have when students are not um, being identified and or not receiving services in their early childhood years. Yeah, DD was way down in 2020, you're right. So the long-term effects, this is something we're gonna, I, I don't know that we really have a handle on um, what these long-term effects are going to be, but I would imagine we're going to be dealing with this for years to come. Um, let's see. Catherine says there needs to be, they need, yeah, their needs will be higher 
as they get into kindergarten and up, and I agree, because a lot of times those students in preschool get the services they need and then don't need the special education services when they get into elementary school. So these are things that, that we're just going to have to be aware of and be sensitive to and um, just be prepared for. Um, some other items that I've noticed over the across years, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this, certain disabilities have grown while others have decreased disability categories. Um, and I don't know if that's more of an awareness or if it's because of um, environmental issues that have caused it. So just things to keep in your mind as we go. Yeah, autism is definitely on the rise. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, that's um, that's one that, that really jumps out at me. If you look at, at the preschool numbers, we in 2010, we started at 425, and in 2020, we had 1,078. And that's with a decrease in numbers. Like, if you look at 2019, it's 1,219. So, yeah, it's that is definitely on the rise. And, I, you know, you could speculate the reason, but regardless of what the reason is, I have a feeling it's not going to go away. So, okay. The other data collection that we do is the uh, State Performance Plan Annual Performance Report, SPPAPR. Um, so every six years we create a state performance plan and we are right now in the middle of creating our state performance plan for the 2021 school year through the 25-26 school year, I think. Um, so we do that every few years, every six years, and then every year we submit a report that shows our progress toward our goals with the data. Um, and there are 17 indicators that are required to be examined by the federal government. And those are, and I couldn't fit them all in one slide, I wish I could, but. Um, so we look at graduation and dropout. And I'm going to show you as a state how we've done for the last six years. Um, so graduation, dropout, assessment, we look at participation and we look at proficiency, students who are proficient or distinguished, um, students with IEPs who are proficient or distinguished. Um, and we are going, that's going to look a little bit different starting next year, where we're going to separate out our um, alternate assessment students from our regular assessment students. Um, and we're also going to have to report on the gap between students with IEPs and all students. So um, that'll be an interesting item to look at as we go through the next few years, especially with assessment being so crazy right now with COVID. So um, indicator four is suspension and expulsion. We only look at students who were removed out of school 10 days or more. Indicator five is um, LRE, how many students, how much time do students spend in the regular regular education classroom. And then indicator six is the same for preschool. Indicator seven is preschool outcomes um, and the progress students make from when they enter preschool to when they leave. Um, indicator eight is parent involvement. Indicator nine is disproportionate representation and we look at that by race. So our students of one disability, I'm sorry, our students of one race being identified with, as students with disabilities um, more than students of other races. And we look at that overall with all disabilities and then we look at specific disability categories. Um, child find is a 60 day timeline that I was just telling you about. Um, indicator 12 is if a student is um, is receiving first steps, um, I think is, that's what it's called, 
it's called something different in Kentucky than it was in Florida, and I used to work in Florida, so I'll get them mixed up. But if they're receiving first steps um, services, did did they were did they receive an IEP by their third birthday, or were they eligible to receive an IEP and receive one by their third birthday? Um, secondary transition is um, for students ages I think 16 and up. Um, did they receive the proper uh, transition planning in their IEPs. Uh, post school outcomes is what happens to students after they leave one year after they leave. Um, secondary or yeah, leave high school. Um, and then resolution sessions and mediation are things that we have to report on as a state. The districts don't have to report on that. And then the SSEP is uh, this state systemic improvement plan and um, I think probably I don't know if you've um, learned about that or not that's that's a sort of a long-term plan that involves um, I think we're working on math and some behaviors on that um, statewide okay so graduation the way you want to look at this we talk about the we have our targets. So the line at the top, the straight line, are our targets. Um, our goal is to be above the target. Sometimes you want to be above, sometimes you want to be below. But if you think graduation, you want more kids to graduate. Um, and then so the, the question is every year when we report this, did we meet target and did we have slippage? And if we if we slippage means we got worse by at least one percentage point. So this is how we've done over the last few years. Um, we don't, this is um, a year behind, this data is a year behind because we don't get the data, the graduation data until we've already submitted our um, report. So the latest we have is 1819 data and we were at 75% graduation. For student, this is for students with IEPs. Um, dropout, we've done pretty well with dropout. We didn't necessarily meet our, our targets, but we've done really well with this. This is students ages 14 to 21 um, who dropped out of high school as compared to all students with IEPs ages 14 to 21. So we, we were at 3% in 2014 and now we're down to 1.79. So we've been doing really well on that. And our goal here is to be below the target because you want fewer students to drop out. I didn't do indicator three. Um, I just realized indicator three isn't in here um, because we have to report on so many items. We have to report on by grade, grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight in high school for math and for reading. Um, I can tell you that for the participation, our goal was 99% and we met that almost all the way across the board, um, except for high school math in the last two years. Um, and our, we did not meet any of our proficiency goals and we were nowhere near it and it's kind of sad to look at, which is the other reason I didn't include it. Um, we were, we're going to be re-examining our targets for the next six years very soon. Um, so indicator 4A. So if, if you go back to some of these, um, to this list, some of these have an asterisk at the end of them. That means they are compliance indicators. And compliance indicators have to have a goal of either 0% or 100%, depending on which way you want to go. So indicator 4B, 4A is not a compliance indicator, so we could set our own targets for those. Um, if you notice here, this is the number of districts that had, that showed dis significant discrepancy. Um, so we had six, in 2017 and six in 2018, 
we actually changed the way we were looking at it so we could reach more districts. We were finding that um, when we talk about cell size, that means there have to there has to be at least ten. Well, we had yeah at least ten students who were suspended more than ten days. And honestly, there was only one district in the state that had enough students to be suspending more than 10 kids, more than 10 days. Um, so we kind of felt like it wasn't fair to them. So we um, we reduced our cell size and start and changed it to two. So now the dis now districts have to have suspended at least two kids. Um, greater than 10 days to be considered. So that's why our data looks kind of wonky here because we made some changes in 2015, 16. Um, and then this one is a compliance indicator, which means our target is 0%. And we did the same thing here, so we changed our, our cell size. Um, so we had more students, but they're learning, they're getting better. So we're getting there. Indicator five, we are awesome at this. So this is 5A is students who are in the classroom greater than 80% of the day. And our target was 72% and we're at we're at 74%. So we're good. Indicator B, we want to be below the target. This is students who are in the regular classroom less than 40% of the day. Again, we're really good at this. Now I don't know how this is going to look after COVID, but for now we're good. And this is students who are in separate schools, residential facilities, or homebound hospital. And we want that to be low and we're doing great at that one as well. So placement is something we're really good at. Same thing with preschool environments. We meet our target easily. OK, indicator seven is one. I don't know how much you guys work with preschool, um, but this is something you're going to want to be aware of if you are going to. Um, if, if you want to become a director of special ed, this is something you need to be aware of because a lot of teachers, especially preschool teachers, don't understand the importance of, of this specific indicator. But for there are several indicators. Um, we look at social, emotional, early language and communication and appropriate behaviors. And um, we look at of those students who entered or exited, um, did they substantially increase their growth by the time they turned six? Or were they within, so that's the first one. The second one is, were they within age expectations? So did they improve? And then did they actually reach the expectations? And so this is our data. You want to be above the target. Um, so we've done pretty well here. We've done really well here, actually. If you notice, there was a big bump in 2017. Um, and honestly, that is because we, it's not, it could be because the kids were doing better, but it's also because we did a better job of collecting the data. Because um, a lot of the preschool teachers didn't understand the importance of this, so either they just didn't do it or they made it up or they, you know, there were a lot of different things going on. So just understanding that data is important is, is a big step to showing improvement. Um, so that's for indicator seven. And you can see across the board, we, we significantly improved from 2017 on. So um, indicator eight is parent involvement. And basically what this is, it's a survey that we send to parents of students with IEPs and ask them um, if, our, if, if they feel that they were being included in IEP decisions. And our data looks awesome, but the problem is um, we have about a four or 5% response rate, four or five, not 45. So this is something that we're going to have to start reporting on statewide to the federal government. Um, and we're going to have to start increasing those numbers. So we're going to have to get parents more involved in this. 
Um, disproportionate representation. So are we identifying students of a, a specific race more than all other students? Indicator nine is all we just look at them across the board, all disabilities, and we're doing great. Um, we've been at zero percent, zero districts have shown disproportionate representation for indicator nine for since 2017. Um, indicator 10, not quite as good. These look at specific disabilities. They look at um, EBD, which is educational behavioral disability. We look at OHI, their health impairment. Um, I think we look at developmentally delayed. Um, there are a few other categories similar to those. Um, but we're not quite doing as well, but I think we're showing improvement there as well. This is a 60 day timeline. Look what happened in 2019. Anybody surprised by that? What do you think caused that? OK, um, yeah, that was a COVID year, so they couldn't get kids in to test them. Indicator 12 was the same. Yep, no face to face testing. That's exactly it. They couldn't get kids in. And in preschool, it was even worse because parents were with the younger kids. They were really scared to get kids in and. It was just and they really honestly, because it, preschool is not required, it was hard to get them to even respond. So. Um, indicator 13 is secondary transition that kind of dropped in 2018 and 2019. We're still doing pretty well, um, but these things because we can still do arcs virtually. These things should continue on as planned um, throughout, you know, even throughout COVID because we can do things virtually. Post school outcomes. So um, 14A is the percent of students one year out of high school who were attending um, a, I think it was um, like a college, like a four year university. So we're not quite where we want to be there. Um, indicator B, we've kind of gone down there, but again, COVID, um, we kind of expected that. This is students who either are attending a four year program or are competitively employed or attending some other like a two year program. And then 14 C is other employment. So. And we've done really well there as far as. Um, as as far as you know, meeting our target, we had to change our target because we had to uh, make some changes. I think they included um, pre -ets, pre. I don't even know what pre -ets stands for. Um, educational transition services, that's what it is. So we had to include that in 14 starting in 2019. So we had to change our targets for that. Um, and so the other thing that we do as a state, so every year after we submit our SPP APR, um, we are evaluated by the US Department of Education um, on, on how well we've done with our targets and how timely we've entered, how timely and accurately we've entered our data. And um, I think that that one includes NAEP as well, at least it did this year. Um, so we get graded on that. They call it determinations. And then we are required to do the same for districts. So we issue determinations annually based on uh, performance, mainly around um, the SPP APR, the indicators. Plus we look at um, complaints and those sorts of things. So. So yeah, so these are things that these are reasons um, you want to kind of pay attention to the data and and these are all just statewide requirements and, and federal requirements. But really, if you think about it. This data, if you 
break it down to the school level or to the classroom level could be extremely helpful to you as well um, in making decisions for teachers and for principals at the building level. So any questions? Thank you, Catherine, for the pre-employment transition services. I couldn't remember. All right. Turn it back over to Bill, I think, or Pete. Sure. Sorry, go, go ahead. Oh, that's you, Pete. Uh, I think I think you're next. I think we're nearing yeah. the end of the agenda. If you want to, we are quite. I've the recording says two minutes and two hour, two hours and eleven minutes. So we've uh, we've more than more than taken care of our time allocation. Uh, wanted to thank the folks that made up our agenda, Kathy and and Chris and and Amy. And sorry, Kathy, Chris, and Amy, and uh, wanted to let everyone know, and Bill had put it in the chat, that copies of both of those PowerPoints will be in the resource folder, uh, which is in our SharePoint site. And uh, Thomas, did you have anything you wanted to say? Uh, no, I uh, no. Just I, I guess just a reminder to uh, uh, to check SharePoint uh, for the information that I referenced earlier around the roles and responsibilities. And if you have if you have any questions, uh, to to, uh, to make sure that you contact us. Uh, but that's all that I have for you. And thank you for that. And, and just a quick, those of you that have uh, not reached out to a university, please do so. And. Uh, to get that going and it again if you will email me i put my email in the in the chat so if you need any supports of any kind thomas and i'll be at the ready so without further ado it looks like the 24th of april is our next opportunity to get together and uh thank you all for your attendance bye now <laughs>